All right. So, for today's recording, um, I figure it would be uh, fairly fucked if I didn't go over uh, July 4th on July 4th. But, yesterday, the audio for my recording was fucked up. And the reason it was fucked up is because I guess one of my uh, webcams hijacked the audio uh, for my for, for my recording and basically meant that uh, I couldn't uh, put out yesterday's stream because the audio quality was just so bad there was like hissing and you know a bunch of stuff I tried to get it out but I couldn't so with that being said I'm going to re-record the entire fucking thing and put it out uh, tomorrow but uh, today I thought I'd go over something that like very few Murricans want to admit, like, and this is on all sides of it, um, like, the pre-manufactured sides, Democrat and Republican, the duopoly, the mainstream economists and shit, they usually don't want to talk about the fact that Independence Day is a fucking joke. Um, the U.S. was never independent. Not once. So, let me go over why that is. For those of you who don't know, the war was not like magic. It, it was. It wasn't like everybody just agreed to go work for no food, and no pay, uh, to make the revolution happen. They still had to like eat and do silly things like buy ammunition and war tools and equipment and shit. They they couldn't just fucking ship people around based on farts and cake. Um, so, like, the ultimate truth here is um, they had to finance it. And how did they do that? Well, they were very, as every historian who goes over this will tell you, cash-strapped. So their cash-strapped ass decided to go finance their war based on uh, foreign loans. Uh, and, and, and assistance from foreign governments. Uh, I'm going to read something straight from state.gov to go over some of this. Um, I'm not making this up. I'm not going to, you know, Alex Jones, David Icke, cosplay fantasy ship.com. I'm going directly to the source here. Not that, you know, Alex Jones or David Icke are bad sources for certain information. And if you add hominem and just ignore all of what they say, you're part of the problem. But just to be super specific here, this is state.gov. This is the U.S. government's official account of events. So don't fucking come at me with, oh, it's just a conspiracy theory, blah, 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 blah. Uh, I don't care. I won't care. Um, so uh, it starts out by saying, and this is on U.S. Debt and Foreign Loans, 1775 to 1795. It starts out by saying, During the American Revolution, a cash-strapped Continental Congress accepted loans from France, paying off the, these and other debts incurred during the Revolution, proved one of the major challenges of the post-independence period. Post-independence. I love how they fucking throw that in there. Yeah, yeah, you're post-independence, all right, while you're still fucking beholden to a foreign government. Totally. Yeah, you're not at all fucking bullshitting on that score. Um, and and while I'm at it, uh, the, the U.S. government loves to claim that it's independent in this regard, but ultimately... What you're dealing with when you're dealing with these people is a group of people who is always dependent on someone else. Um, right now, it's globalism. So, just to be incredibly specific, anytime you hear in an official government source the independence claim, it's just a lie to induce you to not hate them for the rest of the stuff that they're doing in the piece. So, just... Uh, to get that out of the way, the new U.S. government attempted to pay off these debts in a timely manner, but the debts were at a times a source of diplomatic tension. I wonder why they would be a source of diplomatic tension. Almost like another country can 
use these loans to hold them over your head. Nah, that couldn't be. Uh, the U.S. was independent at the time. Uh, <laughs> the Continental Congress, in, or in order to pay for its significant expenditures during the revolution, Congress had two options, print more money or obtain loans to meet the budget deficit. In practice, it did both, but relied more on the printing of money, which led to hyperinflation. At that time, Congress lacked the authority to levy taxes, and to do so would have risked alienating an American public that had gone to war with the British over the issue of unjust taxation. Woo! Gotta love that shit. That's perfect, ain't it? Like, that really sums up the entire fucking thing. Because the U.S. government intended to operate in a very similar and eventually even more egregious fashion than the British but they had to make it seem like the Brits were the awful group that you should definitely fight and kill um, because they had to make it seem as though this split was happening for wholly like people-motivated grassroots reasons. But the origins of U.S. independence and revolution were astroturf because it was inflation, a hidden tax as it is called by right-thinking people, um, which funded a significant amount of the war. And that debt would take a fuck-long time to pay back um, and eventually contribute to the uh, ever-mounting debt uh, that people had in the future. Because ultimately, when you operate that way, you're going to get used to spending beyond deficit your your gdp debt ratio will always be inverse because you're fucking stupid uh about like spending within your means or because you don't care about the state of the economy and you actually want to spend it into the dirt so that everybody will be forced onto your taxation and debt chattel slavery thing the thing that stefan molyneux called a tax farm back when he was more libertarian like the whole idea here should be to look at what the U.S. government was doing and its effects on the people. And so the U.S. government was massively hyperinflating their currency, um, and they would eventually end up taxing people into oblivion, um, like, way on down the line, because they set up a house of cards, and they're waiting for it to, uh, to collapse. Like... It's just kicking the can down the road a little bit more every time there's a new presidential election. It's fucking stupid. But the point I'm trying to raise here is that, um, that like, the U.S. government initially already started to steal from the American people in order to pay for the war, and they did it uh, through the power of taxation by inflation, and then eventually by rote taxation itself, which is why the Whiskey Rebellion happened and why it was crushed, because the U.S. government had no intention of allowing people to live without the taxes that they thought they fought the British to get rid of. Um, but the, the other ultimate part of this is the loans. The f this is um, continuing the article, because I've only read two paragraphs so far. That was mostly me editorializing. But the French government began to secretly ship war material to the American revolutionaries in late 1775. This was accomplished by establishing dummy corporations to receive French funds and military supplies. It was unclear whether this aid was a loan or a gift, and disputes over the status of this early assistance caused strong disagreements between American diplomats in Europe. Arthur Lee, one of America's commissioners in France, accused another, Silas Denet, of financial misdealings, while the third member of the commission, Benjamin Franklin, remained aloof. Lee eventually succeeded in convincing Congress to recall Dean. The early French aid would later resurface as one of the disputers behind the 1797 XYZ affair that led to the quasi-war with France. Because France wasn't happy that the U.S. didn't see things the way they did, and they tried to control the U.S. because the U.S. was not, you know, fucking independent. The U.S. was still relying on foreign countries. The U.S. just wasn't necessarily beholden to them on paper. But you know what? They were beholden to them. 
Because that's how the American people started to be taxed to pay for loans that were for a war that was paid for, essentially, by France. Um, which is why it's kind of partially funny when Americans make anti-French jokes, because, like, if you're patriotic at all, if you support the U.S. government at all, then you got to kind of admit that France had your back in the beginning. But anyway... During the revolution, the French government also provided the Americans with loans, eventually totaling over two million dollars, most of which were negotiated by Benjamin Franklin. John Adams also secured a loan from Dutch bankers in 1782. After fighting between the Americans and the British ended in 1783, the new U.S. government established under the Articles of Confederation needed to pay off its debt, but lacked sufficient tax authority to secure any revenue. The government struggled to pay off the loans, stopping payments of interest to France in 1785 and defaulting on further installments that were due in 1787. The U.S. also owed money to the Spanish government and private Dutch investors, but focused on paying off the Dutch because Amsterdam remained the most likely source of future loans, which the U.S successfully obtained in 1787 and 88 despite his precarious financial state so let that sink in 10 years after 1776 they're still getting loans from foreign governments well foreign countries whatever and these loans are what allow them to be essentially a warfare state it's like it's like an early proto-military industrial complex for the US like this this is sort of what laid the foundation right um, and then it says in <laughs> in in this uh, in this article here uh, under the US Constitution of 1789 the new federal government enjoyed increased authority to manage US finances and to raise revenues through taxation uh, responsibility for managing debts fell to the Secretary of Treasury, Alexander Hamilton. Hamilton placed U.S. finances on firmer ground, allowing for the U.S. government to negotiate new loans at lower interest rates. In addition, the U.S. began to make regular payments on its French debts starting in 1790 and also provided an emergency advance to assist the French in addressing the 1791 slave revolt that began the Haitian Revolution. Although the federal government was able to resume debt payments, total federal expenditures exceeded revenues during many years in the 1790s. Hamilton therefore sought additional loans on Dutch capital markets, although the improved U.S. financial situation made these loans easier to obtain. These private loans from Dutch bankers also helped pay off loans owed to the Spanish government, back pay owed to foreign officers, and U.S. diplomatic expenses in Europe. Independence, am I right? Because Disconnecting from Britain means you're independent. We can ignore literally everything else. All the wealth of bullshit. Because the U.S. is not connected to Britain. And that's what matters, guys, right? We're not connected to Britain. That's all that matters. All we needed to do was disconnect from Britain and now we're independent. Yeah, we're beholden to the French and the Dutch and the Spanish and whoever else sucked our balls enough to do the revolution with us. But you know what? We're still independent because we say so and fuck you. <laughs> That's exactly all it is. That's 100% all it is. In 1795, the U.S. was finally able to settle its debts with the French government with the help of James Swan, an American banker who privately assumed French debts at a slightly higher interest rate. Swan then resold these debts as a profit on domestic U.S. markets. The U.S. no longer owed money to foreign governments, although it continued to owe money to private investors, both in the U.S. and Europe. Six of one, half a dozen of another, if you ask fucking me. Although U.S. finances had been shaky under the Articles, the U.S. was able to place itself on sound financial footing during the 1790s. This enabled it to preempt diplomatic embarrassment and dependence on foreign powers during that period. 
and also improved U.S. credit on European capital markets, which enabled the U.S. Gov to obtain low-interest loans from the Louisiana Purchase in 1803. Huh? So, the U.S. was always based on foreign assistance, loans, fucking foreign troops, foreign equipment, all this stuff. It was always a myth that the U.S. was independent, and the start of the country was rife with fucking foreign independence, which is why they quelled rebellions, because they fucking could. Then, fast forward a little bit, and suddenly, they need more revenue. How does a warfare state get more revenue? Uh, I wonder, I wonder. Maybe break a few treaties with some Native American tribes. Maybe claim that it's God's will that you move west and do westward expansion through manifest destiny. Have Columbus, uh, this fucking, this fucking sleazebag who murdered massive amounts of people, be reimagined and rebranded as a goddess, Columbia leading everybody west to eliminate the savage threat and bring the brightness of day that direction. Independence, trademark. So maybe uh, the U.S. wasn't independent at the start. Maybe they had to do a few genocides and mass land theft to get where they wanted. Maybe that resulted in a huge amount of violence being the norm in the start of the country and resulted in, you know, a war with the Spanish later on because they tried to move into territories that Spain claimed to own. Uh, that they also got through conquest and bloody empire and colonial wars and shit. Um, you know, yeah, all this is true, right? But at least the country started out that way. Well, no. Because it always had this infection from a, a base level by the Freemasons. Because the country was started partially through gold secured from the Dutch through a guy named Heim Solomon, uh, who George Washington uh, called on directly, regularly, to get gold uh, to finance the wars. Uh, the treaties that they that they worked out uh, were all partially resultant from this guy. Uh, the The guy would basically run to the the like foreign powers, secure the the funding, and bring it back. So obviously, the Freemasonry at the root of a lot of American stuff would lead to uh, the general vibe being. You threaten the foundation of our country, um, and we will end you. We will make your life difficult, if not over. So, the ultimate thing that then happened was, the U.S. had a bunch of territory, and part of that territory was the South, and everybody in the U.S. still had slaves, um, and slaves were huge, especially since they weren't, you know, they, they were of all races, but they were all poor, indentured servants, but they were primarily black, and the entire foundation for a lot of the U.S. economy at that particular point was directly extorting and violently abusing people so that they would stay in line and so that they would stay on your plantation and so that they would continue to do your work for you or so that they would build your railroads or so that they would build your homesteads or help you claim land or work for the government or buy your war bonds. So, this government was always bloody and brutal and it was always reliant on foreign loans. And suddenly you've got a very thriving economy based on fucking people's lives over the american dream of freedom etc was for wealthy white male landowners that's all that's it so when you hear these people blowing up bombs that's what they want i'm getting this in like right before they're about to start blowing up bombs so you know <laughs> it's funny 
that these bombs that would be illegal for common people to blow up are about to go off here. But that's that's a, a funny subject for another time. Either way, the point I'm trying to make here is that this was always the way it was right up to the Civil War when it really started to kick the fuck off because now the U.S. was fighting its own people. So now the U.S. needed to run the same program but in overdrive. So what did they do? Well, uh, in the Civil War, <laughs> I'm going to read some stuff from uh, Baudouin dot edu uh by tom porter uh and it's an interview with david thompson uh and this went into some detail but um it goes into the fact that uh this this is the question given that federal finances on the eve of war were in complete disarray uh how did the government manage to instill enough confidence in its financial system to persuade ordinary people to purchase bonds and pay for the war that's the million dollar question is the answer. If you'll forgive the financial reference. This is the issue I'm trying to more fully explore as I transition from the dissertation to the book. Previous scholars have emphasized the patriotic self-interest that came to be associated with war bonds as the chief reason behind their success. I think that is true in part, but I believe wartime ex exigencies and the fundamental shift in the American financial infrastructure between the Legal Tender Act and the National Banking Act in no small part helped to facilitate the overall success of the bonds when coupled with the brilliant marketing campaign put forward by Jay Cook that only grew as the war progressed. Confidence became the reality and enabled such widespread sales. How much was the war financed by investors outside the US? US securities became a global commodity during that period with high volume sales crossing the Atlantic to new buyers in England, France, the German states, Switzerland, Belgium, Russia, Austria, Ireland, the Italian states, and the Netherlands. Even Cuban planters invested heavily despite their slave-owning practices. It's hard to put an exact number on it because of the poor records for the secondary market, but during the war itself, I'd say, that I'd say it's safe to claim $400 million of union bonds were purchased by international investors. So, the original war, heavily funded by the outside, needed the outside, depended on the outside. The period up to and until the Civil War needed the outside, was funded by the outside, and required the theft of the outside, the brutality of the outside, and even the enslavement of the inside. And then... The Civil War relied on all of that. Remember that the Union still held slaves, too. It's not like they really objected to that. Um, that took some doing and some time, even after the war, uh, to get everybody on the same page. So, realistically speaking, um, there was not a moment until um, the like Civil War was over where the U.S. was independent. Even after the Civil War was over, though, the U.S. still was then connected to a bunch of foreign finance um, and relied on a bunch of uh, assistance in a bunch of regards. And basically, globalism started then because the U.S. had beaten its, like, sort of uh, dissidents into submission and it could finally move on to a fi more final stage in this regard. Now... Abraham Lincoln didn't end slavery. He wrote in to the, like, well, the, the Emancipation Proclamation included uh, a, a provision that if you were a criminal, you could still be enslaved, which means that the prison industrial complex was started and established by the same people who ramped up the prototype for the military industrial complex uh, that was the... Uh, uh, loan and bond process during the previous wars. Um, so ultimately, these people still needed slaves. So they still enslaved members of the public, most of them uh, dark-skinned people, because they could just say that they were loitering or 
they were <laughs> they they were soliciting or something like that and and like all these Jim Crow laws that came out of fucking nowhere suddenly enabled a massive racist and classist transfer of the poor to the prison system so that they could still have slavery to rely on then after all of this uh they still had uh massive amounts of financial instability because the u.s was never based on fucking uh independence it was always based on the u.s government's ability to convince other countries to work with them um and in this particular case it led into really really fucked up spending until harding got in there cut some of that spending prevented a depression and was shat on by everybody but then after that uh they got in people who did the opposite of what harding did and ultimately pushed for a massive amount of spending that led to roaring periods and fucking like like of, of spending and roaring periods of unemployment and suddenly the u.s government had things that they had to deal with so they went to like wars and massive amounts of death happened but then krugman gets to say that these wars prevented us from <laughs> completely imploding so hey i guess all the death doesn't matter i guess the enslavement doesn't matter i guess the brutality doesn't matter i guess the foreign requirement for assistance didn't matter I guess the fact that the U.S. was never truly independent doesn't matter. I guess the fact that it's soaked in blood and the military-industrial complex proceeds to this day in ever fever-increasing pitch. Um, I guess none of that matters. What matters is that people feel good about it because they still celebrate Independence Day. Even after uh, all these fucking like lockdowns and restrictions even after the government promised to make things worse they're still willing to claim that it's independent and blow things up in the air in celebration of this fake independence so let me tell you what why don't you have a good time today you know why don't you have some fucking uh incredibly bad for you food under the guise of murica why don't you have your 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 shooting range with your incredibly restricted firearm because murica why don't you pay taxes on all of these things because murica why don't you forget that the u.s was beholden to many foreign countries because murica why don't you do all of this and forget that the entire purpose of this country is to lull you into a trance to forget that it's basically just worse britain like yeah, Britain might seem worse right now because of this speech and because of a bunch of other things, but you know what? Britain is small. The U.S. is huge, and the U.S. controls a significant amount of territory outside the U.S. by having the most foreign bases of any country. So, like, maybe, maybe the U.S. has always been dependent. Maybe now it's worse than ever, especially with Operation Cyclone meaning that the war on terror has u.s backed and funded enemies maybe with the cold war which means that the u.s can still have red scares even today and you know you're a russian you're a russian you're a russian everyone's a russian there are russians in my fucking drink um maybe all of this stuff is the result of a fundamentally broken bloody and brutal system of enslavement that disguised itself as a free and independent nation because let me tell you something they don't give a shit about the constitution but the point is that like the whole idea of the u.s has always been to tell you that it's small government to tell you that you have freedom you know it's always been to lie to you in that regard you know it's been to tell you that you're free while giving you ever increasing amounts of legislation while overfunding the cops, DeSantis, while <laughs> massively increasing their budgets and their toys, Biden, um, while doing all of this with the disguise of free choice, because, hey, you could have chosen between Biden and Trump, and that means Biden is not going to be anything like Trump, right? He's going to keep all his promises? Wrong. He broke all of them. Trump broke most of his. Obama broke most of his. 
Bush broke most of his. And they did it all to serve the same interests that the U.S. has been serving since its inception. The greedy, the banksters, the Freemasons, the people behind it all who puppeteer the banks and the financial institutions and keep people in line, you know? Maybe the U.S. has never been independent because it was never supposed to be. Maybe the, the fact is that when they establish colonies like this, they have to make it seem like you have a choice so that, you know, if you don't like it, you can leave. Well, no. If you leave, they fuck you over more because suddenly you're not a U.S. citizen. Suddenly you're not within the borders. Suddenly if you accidentally, accidentally, accidentally get drone striked or intentionally if you're Anwar or Al Abdul Rahman al um, if, if, you, if you accidentally or purposefully get drone striked, suddenly it's not a fucking problem because you were over there. That's fine. It's totally, nobody's going to go to jail for that. It's murder, but fuck those people, am I right? I'm, I'm like, I'm frustrated, because it's not Independence Day, it's Dependence Day. It always has been. I don't care how patriotic you are, I don't care what songs you want to sing today, I don't care how much chronic masturbation you engage in to convince yourself that it's anything other than a massive dependency cycle and circuit for the profit of those in power. I don't care what you do, because the ultimate truth of it is that the U.S. has been this way since the start. It was never better. You can't make America great again because it was never especially better to begin with. So let's disabuse ourselves of the notion of independence, especially of American independence, because the only true way to be independent is to recognize that you own yourself, you have all the rights to yourself, and you need to smash the state. One more thing. This is brought to you by Liberty Centuries, at Liberty Centuries, at Twitter. Liberty Centuries strives to bring you interesting, liberty-minded content to your fingertips. They cover a wide variety of subjects, from philosophy to politics, science, and much more. Check them out at Liberty Centuries on Twitter and on their Liberty Centuries Medium page. They sponsor this content, so feel free to check them out and let them know I sent you. Be well, all.